Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Matt McCleary. I am the president of Marine Money and also a member of the index committee of the Marine Money Decarbonization Index. And it's a pleasure to have all of you with us today. I think we're going to have a very interesting uh, 25 minutes together and um, really appreciate your joining us. Um, before we kick it off, I just want to quickly thank the High Tide Foundation uh, for sponsoring this event and actually um, an annual, a series of, of uh, monthly events for the entire year on marine decarbonization. Uh, High Tide is an amazing organization. If you don't know them, I would encourage you to, to learn more about them. They're doing uh, lots of very cool things on the subject of uh, mitigating climate change. And uh, we're very fortunate that they've chosen our industry as one to kind of focus on. So, so thanks to everyone at, at High Tide. Um, Hal Malone uh, is really the star of the show today. And, um, but before I turn it over to Hal, I just would like to give you some background on marine money and, and our role in this project and uh, kind of how we fit into all this. Uh, I'm gonna take about five minutes and I'm gonna talk about really four different things. Uh, first of all, our role in, in decarbonization. We're gonna talk a little bit about the Marine Money Decarbonization Index. Um, I'm gonna talk a little about the ETF. Hal is gonna to spend more time on that. And then we're gonna um, give you a short survey, which is really gonna be a component of the decarbonization investment study, which is a, a more comprehensive study that we're gonna release at Marine Money Week uh, in New York City um, in June. So with that, um, a little bit of background. So as many of you know, we've been involved in the ship finance industry really since the 80s when we were founded by Jim Lawrence. And during that time, you know, we've seen a few kind of mega trends that have really changed the business, really changed the way the industry functions. Uh, probably the best example is the capital markets, which started in the late 1980s with a couple of um, self-liquidating IPOs. Uh, gathered momentum in the 90s. We saw more IPOs and, and uh, about 35 high yield bond offerings. In the 2000s, we saw almost 40 IPOs done around the world, uh, primarily in the US market, but around the world. That sort of ushered in a whole new era for the industry in terms of bringing in outside capital, uh, which then uh, evolved into private equity and then private credit and now uh, the introduction of, of infrastructure funds. Um, my, my point to all that is, is that uh, that was a movement that, that really changed the industry. And it wasn't just for the companies that, that use the capital markets. It really changed the standard of the way business is done in shipping. And that has to do with transparency, governance, cost of capital, and, 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 and all sort of uh, important metrics like that. We think marine decarbonization is that times a thousand. I mean, that's the only math I'm gonna to do today, I promise. Uh, but, but we think what's happening now in our industry is nothing short of uh, monumental. And there are a couple of reasons for that. You know, One is that it doesn't just involve ship owners and, and capital formation. It involves everyone in the entire community, everyone in the value chain. And you know, so that's important to bear in mind uh, because it's gonna have a greater impact. Right, it's 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 everyone. It's the ports, it's the uh, insurance, it's finance, it's ship owners, charters, consumers, not just shipping companies. Um, and it's not just about money. It's about the health of the environment, which is which is obviously on a whole nother scale. Um, so, like many of you on this on this call today, we became very passionate about this. You know, we tried to figure out how can we use everything that we have built, our knowledge, our our contacts, our our platform, how can we make some small contribution to this um, monumental movement? And so anyone who knows us knows that our DNA is really about uh, bringing people together and bringing ideas together um, and bringing you know, professionals under one roof to, to get creative and share ideas and share solutions to, to products and, and have some fun doing it, frankly, to create some camaraderie and a sense of community. And so our natural first step was to address decarbonization at Marine Money's events, 22 events around the world that we organize in, uh, from our offices in Singapore, Athens, and Connecticut. We have Marine Money Magazine, um, which George Weltman is the editor of. We've increased the content there. We're doing a number of online events like this one. Um, and we try to bring people together in whatever way we can. 
But the more we got into this market, and I think probably many of you share this, the more we realized that really the key players weren't necessarily our core customers, our traditional customers. I mean, ship owners and uh, investors and, um, and lenders are committed to this in their own ways and they're customers of this. But really the companies that are on the leading edge of this movement are technology companies. Um, and we became really fascinated by this. And so that's sort of uh, how the Marine Money Decarbonization Index was born is that we started tracking companies that were providing the products and solutions to help the industry decarbonize. Um, and that's when we started talking to our, our longtime friend, John Cartsonas at Breakwave Advisors in New York. Uh, John is a former shipping analyst and then went on to become a commodity trader and then founded a, a really interesting uh, ETF called BDRY on the New York Stock Exchange, which um, tracks dry cargo freight futures and has been you know, a very useful tool in the marketplace in, in the last, uh, well, especially in the last couple of years, it's been very uh, successful and active. Um, Pal's gonna talk more about ETFs, but for those of you who don't know, it, it's really just a, a kind of a low cost vehicle that's listed on a, on a stock exchange that owns interests in different things. And in our case, different uh, companies that are involved in marine decarbonization. We loved the idea of creating a thematic ETF because it felt absolutely perfect for, for the use. Uh, we loved it because we know that long-term this industry is gonna decarbonize. We know it's a multi-trillion dollar thing and that it absolutely has to happen. What we don't know is how it's gonna happen. Not exactly. There are many different technologies and alternative fuels uh, that are you know, viable and many of them will be successful. It's not a, a mutually exclusive situation, but we're not in a position to sort of be the arbiter of individual companies and technologies. We are more interested in, in the theme of decarbonization. And it's, it's an amazingly robust uh, marketplace. I mean, today and yesterday, I was just going through my notes. Uh, CMA announced a synthetic uh, fuels investment. Uh, CMB launched another hydrogen powered vessel. This one, a crew transfer vessel. The Lovano's family is building uh, uh, vessels to transport captured carbon. There's hydrogen, methanol, ammonia, batteries, wind assist. Vessel retrofits are, are obviously important. MSC announced the investment in a sustainable data company. Pack Basin announced today that they're working with the Japanese shipyard to build zero emissions vessels. I mean, I could go on and on, and I'm sure many of you could too. And that's before you even get into the technology, the, the Zero Norths and the Vessons and the Nautilus Labs who are raising capital and, and, and really reducing emissions today. Uh, so it's an amazingly uh, you know, uh, complex marketplace and uh, there's a lot happening. Um, the other thing we loved about the thematic ETF was that, you know, it can change and evolve as this uh, market evolves, right? So, you know, it's a passive fund because it's not managed day to day, but, but when we look at the ETF in the quarter, uh, every quarter, you can say, okay, there are companies that, that could be added. And a lot of the companies, you know, that will be successful in this space haven't even raised Series A capital yet, right? So it's going to change and, and we can change with it. And Hal's going to talk more about that. Um, so we were like really excited about this and um, we were very fortunate because around the time we were talking to John about this, our friend Hal Malone had left Invesco and, and again, like many of you, he was thinking about the same thing, you know, how could he use his kind of expertise and, and uh, talents working for ship owners and, and uh, on Wall Street to, to help further this important cause. And so we convinced Hal to, uh, to, to uh, come aboard the journey with us and uh, he joined the index committee and you'll, you'll talk, uh, you'll hear more from him in a minute. We were also, also very fortunate that Steve Welly joined us as an analyst. Uh, I think, you know, Steve is, is great. Hopefully if you don't know him, you'll, you'll get to meet him. Uh, invaluable role uh, in this because this is moving so quickly. I mean, it's impossible to keep up with it day to day unless you have a full-time analytical team and, and we have that. And I think that's a, one of the other things that's really uh, valuable about uh, you know, what we're doing with the index and, and the ETF is just tracking this stuff. Um, so we put the band together, we created uh, the Marine Money Decarbonization Index, uh, which Hal will talk more about. We uh, hired a company in Germany called Selective, which is really the leading player in the world in terms of uh, um, managing indices. 
like, like ours. And then Breakwave, together with its partner, ETFMG, launched the, the, um, the ETF, which trades on the ticker BSEA, BC, on the New York Stock Exchange. And again, Hal, I will defer to, to you on that. Um, so before I turn it over to Hal, though, I, I do I want to make one point, and I think it's an important one. Um, we think this is going to be a long journey. You know, there's this temptation in the world, and I would say particularly in the capital markets, to uh, mark everything, to market every minute of every day. Um, and I we we get that, but we, we think this is a very long process. You know, I think uh, like the equity market, uh, the capital markets sort of history that I described. You know, there's going to be steps forward and steps back. We don't think it's going to be easy or smooth, but we know it's going to happen. Um, we don't know who the winners will be, but but ultimately the winner will be the environment, and uh, and there will be commercial companies that succeed because they have to. I mean, there's really no two ways about it. Um, we are faced with a um, situation where there are many different opinions on this, right? I mean. Should this should decarbonization be regulated regionally or locally at the at the port state level? Uh, should it be international? Should there be a carbon tax? Should it be two dollars? Should it be two hundred dollars? Where does the money go? I mean, these are very fundamental questions that are still kind of in play. But yet at the same time, the industry itself is a, is problem solving in nature and has been forever and has already gone to work, irrespective of all that. So we're very we're very confident uh, and excited about this, and we think a diversified approach to it is the way to go. And we think equity is the way to go, uh, based on kind of the the uh, stage of growth that we're in, and we're super excited about it. Um, so I think I've overstated uh, my time, but uh, before I turn it over to Hal, I want to quickly put up a survey, and um, that, as I said, is going to be a component of the. Um, decarbonization investment study that we'll present at Marine Money Week. And so I'd like you uh, to take those questions now. John, if you could put those up, that would be great. And then I'm going to come back on the screen after Hal is finished, and I'll share uh, the results with you um, at that time. Great. Thank you, uh, Matt. And it's uh, really a privilege to uh, be here and have the opportunity to speak uh, with everyone who's uh, joined today. It's uh, hard to believe that it's been over a year since uh, Matt, John, and I started on this journey to uh, begin providing uh, the broader community a greater understanding of marine decarbonization and create a vehicle where uh, average investors can also access and participate in that, uh, what we believe is a hugely exciting theme. As uh, Matt mentioned, uh, he, John, and I make up the index committee for the Marine Money Decarbonization Index. And uh, that uh, index is investable via a New York Stock Exchange listed ETF, the ETFMG Breakwave C Decarbonization Technology ETF. Now, if that is a bit more than a mouthful or maybe even two or three mouthfuls um, and sounds somewhat complicated and confusing, uh, don't worry about that. Um, I, I spent more than uh, two decades in and around Wall Street, as uh, Matt mentioned, and it took me a few rounds to understand it. And we're still trying to explain it to Matt, who, uh, as you heard, has been around since the uh, dawn of shipping in the capital markets. So um, joking aside, I, I'm going to take a few minutes today and uh, break down uh, the MMDI and BC and the relationship between those two. And then I also want to take a few minutes and, and highlight some of the what, what we think are just really exciting and groundbreaking projects that uh, some of the index uh, committee uh, companies are uh, developing and, uh, and seeing in the market as we speak today. So um, if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to uh, collect those via the chat and uh, follow up separately or, uh, or speak one-on-one uh, -on -one at any point uh, after this webinar and, and hope to see many of you uh, at Marine Money Week uh, in uh, a little over a month in New York when we're able to share the, the full results of what we're working on. Um, before uh, going into the uh, MMDI and BC, uh, let me just take a, a couple of minutes and recap the challenges that uh, we're working to help address. And, and Matt really uh, alluded to uh, most of these. 
given the audience today, I trust most of you are familiar with uh, how large and diverse the shipping industry is, its uh, substantial current contribution to global carbon emissions, as well as the regulatory customer and other pressures it faces to uh, accelerate its decarbonization process. The, the challenge is significant. Uh, and the industry is considered by most people to be very hard to abate. And it seems that there is a, an infinite and ever-changing uh, universe of ship types, cargoes carried, and uh, trade patterns that uh, change in uh, unexpected uh, ways for uh, many times uh, tragic uh, reasons. So solving uh, these uh, challenges is gonna require technologies and infrastructure that don't exist today. Uh, as Matt mentioned, we're talking about trillions of dollars of investment to, to make those a reality. But uh, we're encouraged to see the, the range of trailblazing companies from around the globe that are emerging with new technologies, trialing alternative fuels, and coming up with technologies and other exciting solutions to help uh, address these, uh, these and many other challenges that we face as an industry going forward. Some of these companies are existing uh, industry players that have uh, been familiar to the sector for decades, but many are new startups or specialized companies from outside of the uh, industry that are coming into the field for the first time. Um, as Matt mentioned, this complexity makes it very difficult to uh, track, even for uh, the largest of industry players. Um, there are, uh, I was gonna say weekly, uh, big projects announced. Uh, Matt has, uh, has indicated that it seems to be incurring almost on a daily basis now. Um, we find it a challenge uh, to track and, and we have a dedicated team of uh, people, Steve and others that are, are working and researching the companies full time. So uh, you can imagine how uh, complicated it is for those outside of the industry that uh, don't uh, follow it and aren't familiar with the, the different parties uh, to, to follow it and to uh, figure out how they can participate or how they might invest in, uh, in this process. Um, when Matt and uh, I started talking over a year ago about this, it was really because they were getting inquiries from uh, you know, companies, but also investors, foundations, other people that they speak with who were uh, interested in marine decarbonization, but they just couldn't even figure out where to uh, begin understanding uh, what was the uh, opportunity and what solutions were out there. So, uh, so what did, uh, what did uh, Matt, John, and I uh, do to address these challenges? Um, as uh, Matt uh, uh, highlighted, we started by creating the uh, MMDI, which um, we, uh, we launched uh, at Marine Money Week uh, last, last year. And then we partnered with uh, ETFMG to make it investable by the average investor via an ETF with the uh, ticker BSEA. What is in uh, MMDI and a VC? So first of all, it, it's effectively the same thing. They're both composed of a uh, group of publicly traded companies that are from around the world that develop technologies, manufacture equipment, or provide services related to marine decarbonization and offshore energy. They include companies that are providing propulsion solutions, are developing green fuels and related infrastructure, offer onboard systems and software solutions, as well as those that are focusing on offshore energy. Most of these opportunities are at a very early stage of the investment cycle. And this creates what we think is a very uh, compelling investment thesis. And the uh, dollars that we're talking about here are tremendous, um, you know, with the uh, 3.4 uh, trillion being uh, Mr. Martin Stofford's um, estimate, uh, who's a widely recognized figure in the industry. Um, Turning uh, next to spend a, a little more time talking about the MMI, MMDI index in detail, um, you know, I, I want to start by talking about what is a stock index. A, a stock index is simply a, a means of tracking the collective performance of a group of uh, publicly traded stocks. Most people are familiar with the S&P 500, which is an index that tracks a group of uh, 500 large companies or the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which tracks uh, 30 uh, major industrial stocks in the United States. The MMDI is exactly the same concept, except it tracks a group of 40 to 50 public companies active in marine decarbonization. 
But you know, we believe this simple uh, concept provides a valuable starting point for investors and others looking to understand or participate in marine decarbonization. Uh, to get a little bit more uh, into the weeds, um, there are a lot of different ways to construct a, a stock index. Simpler ways include equally weighting the stocks, market cap weighting the stocks like the S&P 500, price weighting uh, the securities like the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and there are many other more complex uh, methodologies that we could talk about. For the MMDI, we determined to divide that index of, uh, as I mentioned, is 40 to 50 companies generally into two tiers. A core tier, which is fixed at 20 companies, and those represent the companies that we believe are the current leaders in their respective areas. And the core tier has a, an 80% index weighting. And then we have the balance of the companies, what we refer to as a tracking tier, which is uh, we expect to generally be between 20 and 30 companies that are developing technologies and business models and other solutions that we think are very exciting. At the moment, there are 24 companies in the tracking tier, which results in 44 global companies in the uh, index. But as Matt mentioned, one of the exciting things about uh, the way we've uh, structured the index is that it's not fixed um, and that we are, have the opportunity to meet every quarter as an index committee with our dedicated analyst team to review industry and company developments and our own independent research. Then we have to determine whether to add companies, remove companies, replace companies, as well as uh, move them between the two tiers based on real-time developments and uh, new companies uh, entering the market. Um, here on the slide, we've highlighted the 20 companies that are currently in the core tier. Uh, I trust many people on this webinar will recognize a lot of the names. However, Matt and I and John will be highly impressed by those among the audience who are familiar with all of the companies and more specifically their various decarbonization initiatives. I certainly wasn't prior to uh, embarking on this project and I, I'm gonna share some more details about a couple of the companies uh, here at the end of my presentation. In addition, I think it's interesting to note the diversity of the names as well as their listing locations. Currently, there are an equal number of core constituents from each of the US and the Norwegian markets and the balance of the core companies are from other European exchanges. This is truly a global business opportunity with a hive of activity in Northern Europe. Advancing uh, now to, uh, to talk a little bit more about what is an ETF, now that hopefully uh, I've clarified uh, the MMDI. Uh, as Matt uh, mentioned, an ETF is an exchange traded fund. So breaking that into its two pieces, an ETF is exchange traded like a stock, and it's a fund, which generally means it holds multiple investments like a mutual fund. So I like to describe an equity ETF like BC as a hybrid of a stock and an equity mutual fund. But as, jo as Matt mentioned, ETFs can invest in a variety of things, stocks, bonds, commodities. Our partner, John at Breakwave, has an ETF that provides investors an investment vehicle for dry bulk freight rates via freight forward agreements. And there are ETFs which invest in carbon credits and many other unique areas. So why would an investor choose an equity ETF versus an individual stock or a mutual fund? First, like a mutual fund, you avoid the risk of single stock exposure while having the ability to invest in a specific theme and benefiting from a professional research team. But unlike a mutual fund, an ETF continuously trades during exchange hours, so you can buy or sell it just like a stock. You can also obtain exposure to global stocks via a US investment vehicle without having to worry about buying and selling stocks on foreign exchanges or in foreign currencies. ETFs tend to be very low cost relative to other investment alternatives, and finally, uh, also allow you to avoid the capital gains distributions associated with many mutual funds, which also increases their tax efficiency. So what did, uh, what did we get when we combined the MMDI and an ETF? BC, um, 
John and I and Matt partnered with uh, ETF uh, MG, which is a specialist ETF manager to launch BC, as Matt mentioned, during UN Climate Week in September of last year. BC is an ETF which tracks the MMDI. That simply means that BC seeks to provide an investment result that before fees and expenses corresponds generally to the performance of the MMDI. For a uh, annual fee of only 75 basis points, which is prorated for the period an investor holds the ETF. So if an investor chooses to go into their investment account and purchase BC shares, these funds are effectively invested in the shares of the MMDI companies. As a result, BC provides ordinary investors an easily accessible opportunity to participate in marine decarbonization, which, as Matt and I have said, we believe is in its infancy and will reshape the industry going forward. But that's also why I'm excited today to participate in launching the inaugural Marine Money Decarbonization Investment Study as we wanna get your views on this theme and use that as part of our mission of advancing uh, both the understanding and access to what is the very complicated and complex um, theme of marine decarbonization. Having covered uh, the, uh, the technical details of the structure, I wanna, uh, I wanna talk a little bit more about things that are, are more exciting before I turn the floor back to Matt to share the initial survey results. Um, first, uh, first, I want to uh, highlight uh, a couple of uh, different uh, projects that uh, BC companies are developing. Many of these seem to me almost like science fiction. The first project, which I uh, have on screen now, is, um, is the uh, Yara Birkeland, which is the world's first autonomous zero emissions container vessel, which sounds like something that's from the future but was in fact christened uh, just under two weeks ago on April 29th. This is a joint project of two BC companies, Kongsberg, which may be better known in the US as an aerospace and defense company, and Yara, which is presently a large fertilizer producer. However, both Kongsberg and Yara have deep commitments and are making substantial investments in marine decarbonization. Kongsberg has followed the christening of the Yara Birkeland with an announcement last week of a second, equally innovative zero emissions coastal container to be developed for the largest furniture manufacturer in Norway, Ekornes. Next, I want to highlight a, uh, a joint venture between uh, two established BC maritime industry leaders, Alpha Laval and Willenus Wilhelmsen. Their uh, joint venture, Alpha Wall Oceanbird, is developing a fully wind-powered vessel to transport automobiles transatlantic. The vessel is expected to carry 7,000 vehicles across the ocean in 12 days at an average speed of 10 knots. This is really a combination of both a groundbreaking and a retro, uh, retro project and has technologies that will be applicable to almost any vessel or cargo type. Finally, I want to highlight a hybrid offshore energy and clean fuel project under development by BC companies Wartzilla and Acker Solutions. Wartzilla and Acker are working on the zero emissions energy distribution at sea concept, or ZEEDS. And this concept aims to harness renewable offshore energy to produce, store, and distribute zero emissions fuels. While their current focus is on ammonia, ammonia this project could be considered fuel agnostic and provides many exciting opportunities, both in terms of offshore power and fuel transition for the maritime sector. These are uh, just a handful of the future shifting projects that BC companies are working on and delivering in real time as we speak. These projects also highlight the diversity of the companies in BC. I uh, illustrated projects that have established sector participants, such as Kongsberg, Alpha Laval, and Wartzilla, major companies entering the industry from other sectors such as Yara, and exciting new platforms like Acker Solutions, which is contributing to the future of the industry with its uh, unique uh, vision and projects. These uh, are the kind of things that make Matt and I excited and give us hope about the future of uh, marine decarbonization, as well as the investment potential as uh, BC. 
and we hope you we hope they excite you as well about these same things. As mentioned, I would be happy to follow up on any questions or clarifications anyone participating or listening to a replay of this webinar may have. And uh, with that, I will uh, turn uh, the floor back over to Matt, who I'm sure has been uh, very uh, vigorously compiling the survey results and will share uh, an initial sneak peek with us here today. That's great, Hal. Thank, thank you very much for that. And uh, there are so many cool things happening in this uh, in this space, and you know we're very proud to to be, you know, participating in it. Very excited, as Hal said. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, we are huge believers in the power of, of people and and kind of coming together as a as a uh, community and sharing ideas. And we really would appreciate your input. Um, you know, many of you are. are you know, involved with operating companies and technology companies. Uh, if you have ideas for us, we are absolutely 100% uh, uh, receptive and would appreciate them. Um, and we'd also, you know, if you'd like to come on the, the, the journey as shareholders in BC, we, we'd, uh, we'd obviously welcome that as well. You know, we're in the process of just, you know, um, we're sort of beginning the, the long journey with one small step and uh, we'd be very happy to, to have you with us. Um, so now, if I may, I'm gonna, uh, show the results of the survey uh, and how uh, you can jump in at any at any time and, and as I said you know we'll present more comprehensive results uh, at Marine Money Week in June um, but very quickly do you think carb decarbonizing the maritime industry is a worthwhile pursuit uh, fortunately 100 percent of the respondents said yes it's good to see that that was a bit of a softball there uh, Matt, was a warm up I don't have any uh, doubters on the uh, on the call yeah, uh, or yeah. taking the survey yet but uh, but that's a good, uh, we'll, uh, we'll see. We'll see if anyone comes out of the woodwork. That's a good. That's a good start. Uh, do you believe um, long-term maritime environmental regulations will uh, soften from current levels, remain the same, or tighten? Looks like a majority of, of people think they're going to tighten. I would agree with that. Hal, I, have, I have to believe. I think that there's still some wishful thinkers out there. Um, but you know, I guess that's why you say you take the survey that people think we're going to get softer from here. So. I think it does. It does come down, as I mentioned earlier, in, in the context of capital markets. It comes down to like standards, right? So, we will obviously see different owners um, and charters uh, behave in different ways. But I think that obviously the, the standard itself is is changing. Can we advance the slide, please? Uh, when do you think uh, substantial investment in maritime decarbonization will begin? Uh, majority of people think now or basically imminently. I think from all the examples that, that Hal mentioned and the few that I noted as well, it is certainly happening uh, in real time. Um, but again, sort of the, the, the tip of the iceberg uh, in terms of what's to come. Uh, who will, this is, a, this is a big question, who will actually pay for the largest share of maritime decarbonization costs? Uh, Looks like good news for the ship owners. Twenty-eight uh, percent. That uh, that's that's good. But I think it's. I think we all know that it's going to be done in different ways, and, and ultimately, um, you know, costs will be passed along to to consumers uh, and charters, and you know, the whole the whole community will bear some cost of this. Uh, who do you think will benefit the most financially from maritime decarbonization? Uh, Hal, I, I defer to you on this this pie. Uh, you know, I, I didn't I didn't stack the deck with this one, but it's uh, it's uh, exciting to see that uh, the audience thinks uh, like we do that it's going to be providers of uh, the technology and the new fuels, um, and, and really plays into the theme that that we're so excited about with uh, with with BC, um, and and so uh, so we'll see uh, we'll see where the final results come out, but that's an encouraging uh, start. Okay, last question. What is the best way for people outside the industry to participate in maritime decarbonization? 46% uh, thematic ETF. That's a like to see that. 20% uh, say individual stock investments. Um, and then 15% green bonds and carbon, carbon offsets. And of course, none of those are mutually exclusive. I think the key kind of feature of that question is uh, outside the industry. That, that's sort of the, the the key term there, because people inside the industry, as Hal and, and I noted, that you know there's a lot of strategic investment happening with technologies that are specific to certain companies. What you know, if you're a ferry company, 
what you're doing is different from if you're a deep sea container ship company. So I think that really is uh, is the caveat there. So I think we've run out of time. I want to I want to thank you all very much uh, for being with us uh, today and and just you know along this journey. We're very proud and excited to be part of it and really invigorated by it. And uh, once again, thanks to the High Tide Foundation for for supporting us and and all the work that that you do. And uh, if anyone is in um, New York for Marine Money Week or Hamburg, Germany next week, uh, we look forward to getting together in person. And as Hal said, always uh, really delighted to get input. Uh, constructive ideas or suggestions are are very welcome as we em embark on this. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you we'll see you soon. <laughs>